Okay, hi everybody. We are finally uh, back after a uh, little couple of messy three weeks. Uh, I'm not really going to go into detail what happened. I'm just going to say things came up. <laughs> so this is um, our first time back in three weeks, so I do apologize for the delay. Um, I remember when we last did our last video, I think on like mid-February, and it's now the going on the second week of March. Uh, I remember we talked about the uh, how the creation of the Confederate government at the very beginning of the American Civil War, and I remember that on the last time I said that our next video would be on the Lost Cause, so that is what we're going to cover today, is that little misguided, this evil little subvertive narrative. So we're going to cover that today, and um, I'm trying to think of anything else here. At the end, nah, we won't do that. Anyway, uh, also of significance this week, this past week I should say now since it's Sunday, marked the one year since I actually have started putting videos up. So in one year, we I've actually got quite a lot covered and quite a few people have watched the video. So that's a good thing, I guess, to hit that one year milestone and not have zero people watching this. I mean, I'm not saying they watch it for a whole lot of time, but at least people have at least clicked on it and watched. So I suppose that's a benefit after one whole year doing this. We still have not hit 100 videos yet, and that should be coming up way before too long. So I might have to do a very special history topic for that one, but we'll see what happens. But anyway, let's get back to topic here. So today we're going to finally get to the lost cause narrative that evolved in the American South and somewhat in the entire United States in the years following the end of the Civil War in 1865. Now, the lost cause narrative, I can tell you right now, it is mostly responsible for the way that modern Americans view the Civil War. They don't realize just how messed up and misguided the Confederacy was, and they have common held beliefs about certain Civil War figures that are not at all, if any bit, true. But this narrative is, in reality, it was a propaganda campaign to try to paint the Civil War different because I don't care what your opinion is here, if you're one of these neo-Confederates or whatever. One way or another, the Civil War was about slavery. It eventually came to be that. It may not have been all entirely that at first with the north side, but with the south side, that's what we're talking about today, is the south's point of view. And I can tell you right now, if you're one of these neo-confederates or lost, co lost cause uh, tenants or ideologists, I don't know how you live with yourself. The evidence is there that points to it, that slavery was the very originating cause for the secession of the southern states in 1860 and 1861. Slavery was the creation of the Confederacy. I don't care how you try to paint that in 50, 50 different views. One way or another, you come back to that word. And believe me, I got a couple of quotes here that we will read toward the very end that show you, or at least give some light, that are from actual Confederate documents or actual Confederate significant political leaders that even point out blank said, it's about slavery. Well, it wasn't about slavery. Oh, really? It wasn't? Well, I think you might want to go back in time and have a talk with your Confederate friends because I can. I, if they heard that it wasn't about slavery, they're probably going to look at you and say, what the blank are you talking about? Of course it was. <laughs> your, own, your own ancestors would tell you the truth. But you are cowards. Because you don't have the guts and the courage to admit that. I understand you want to paint a different kind of picture for maybe like maybe you had a family member that fought the Confederacy. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say that they were explicitly fighting for slavery because the South did have a conscription. They did have a mandatory draft, basically. And more often than not, the rich slave-owning plantation owners were the ones that got away with not having to serve. It was the poor farmers in the South that didn't own slaves that commonly had to serve in the Confederate Army. But, these people could have still chosen to desert. They still could have chosen not to participate. I mean, there's plenty of draft dodgers. And on top of that, why? And the fact that they were complicit in it means that although maybe they didn't own slaves themselves, 
they had some racist racist views. And coming to terms with that is important. And I'm going to mention this too with the, in regards to Confederate monuments. It's an issue that has become highlighted in recent years in America, especially since at least 2015, I believe. And, of course, last year with the uh, George Floyd killing. Um, what I want to highlight here is my point of view. The monuments have always been a divisive issue, and in my point of view, at times I've been entirely for getting rid of them, and other times I've switched in 180 degree, reversed my opinion, and said, no, we need to keep them. I can tell you right now that my finalized opinion is they need to go. Why? I hear the argument over and over and over again. It's part of our history. It's history. We can't get rid of the history. You can't erase it. You're right. We cannot erase it. But monuments and statues are not how we tell history. It's not how we record it. It's not how we learn it. Monuments are kind of a tribute to specific and famous events or people. They're not how we learn it. It's how we memorialize it. We basically put a shrine up. The way we learn history is looking at documented text. We look at speeches. We look at books. We read encyclopedias for crying out loud. That is how we record history. We write it down. Or we take actual historical documents. We don't record it by building a statue of Jefferson Davis. That's not recording history. That's memorializing somebody. That's not recording anything. That's not teaching history to anybody. You're telling me you and you and let's use an example. And this won't be a Confederate. Say we were drive by a monument. And you're driving with your four-year-old kid. Not four-year-old. We'll say six-year-old. Six-year-old kid. And you drive by a statue of Thomas Jefferson. Now at that age, the kid probably don't know who Thomas Jefferson is. They might know Lincoln and Washington. But let's say you drive by a statue of Thomas Jefferson. Well, when I say Thomas Jefferson, the kids can probably read at that point. And I mean, sure, they'll they can read, but. Is that really telling them anything about Thomas Jefferson? A name on a statue is really going to tell them what they stood for, what they did? No. You don't teach history. Statues are not how we record history. Books are. Speeches are. Historical documents are. Statues have no part in that. So for the argument that, oh, we can't get rid of it because it's part of our history, that's a bunch of bullcrap. Because it's not how we record history. It's how we memorialize things. And by putting these statues up of Confederate leaders and significant Confederate figures, you're memorializing basically a racist society. Nice job. Anyway, for the Lost Cause, what really, as we mentioned, the Lost Cause didn't really come about, of course, until after the Civil War because the Confederacy lost the war. They were fairly certain early on that they could win, they, they could gain independence from the United States, and they wouldn't have to be faced with that situation. Well, guess what? Boo-hoo, you lost. And thank God you did. Well, anyway, the Civil War comes to an end in 1865, and, of course, there's these disgruntled Southerners that are not... They want nothing to do with... African Americans. They still are not willing to accept that they're no longer allowed to keep them as slaves. They are still not willing to accept them as equals in their society, like ever. Then they do all kinds of manner to keep African Americans out of Southern society. They restrict their access to voting. They form the KKK, the first iteration of it, to terrorize African Americans and people that would aid them, and Republicans, which were pro African American at the time. Nowadays, I'm not so sure. But anyway, we go for we go from the Civil War, where slavery was legal in the South, and now the South's lost. Slavery is abolished, and the Southern states are under federal military occupation. Of course, there's going to be a lot of disgruntled Southerners that want to form a idea of, well, why did we lose? We were so certain we were going to win that God was on our side. That slavery's right. They start formatting a thing. That slavery, they, they many Southerners, they realized just how evil of a cause slavery had been. And that in the line, although they may not have thought it looked bad, to other people it did. And they were smart enough to realize that. And the Southerners, after the end of the Civil War, there was a lot of them that wanted to try to paint this opposite alternative narrative or theory as to why the South lost. 
what the South was fighting for, to make it seem more pleasing or more, uh, what would be another word here for it? Pleasing would be one more sanitized, I guess, omitting the evils that it had actually committed. And it was shortly after the end of the Civil War that this first came, comes about. The first book that really coined the term The Lost Cause was the book The Lost Cause, which was published in 1866 by a guy named Edward Pollard, which was basically a history of the Confederacy, but he called it The Lost Cause. And it was in this book that some of the beginnings of The Lost Cause narrative emerged, but it was mostly just the coinage of the term. It wasn't until about 10 years later that The Lost Cause narrative actually starts to get developed. Most Southerners believed that the South, in reality, did not have any blame for the war. They didn't believe that the South was illegal in declaring secession. They thought it was entirely legal because they thought that the North was encroaching upon their rights. And then they also thought that slavery was not an immoral practice. It had been perfectly moral. And they actually believed, in fact, that because God was on their side, it couldn't have been divine. So something else had to be an explanation. You had small, and of course, now the statues and monuments didn't occur till much really later on. Now, there were a few immediately after the Civil War that were erected in like areas like cemeteries or town squares, but there wasn't a whole lot because the South was basically in ruins at that point in time after the end of the Civil War. Now, the first modern version here of the Lost Cause narrative comes about during the 1870s, about 10 years after the Civil War, and it's being propagated mostly by former Confederate soldiers and Confederate political leaders and generals. That is who this is mainly being put up by. And even women, to an extent, the, the wives of Confederate soldiers were also very prominent in kind of promoting this alternative narrative for why the Confederacy lost the war and what it was fighting for in the first place. One of the most prominent of these was the former Confederate cavalry general Jubal Early, who was a member of the Army of Northern Virginia. He worked. He was one of Robert E. Lee's cavalry generals, and thus he was active, one of the most military active theaters in the entire Civil War, in the Virginia theater. Early helped to establish the Southern Historical Society during the 1870s, and he came to greatly believe in alternative reasons for the South's defeat, which he, of course, managed to get the Southern Historical Society to believe in as well. They created several truths, and I put quotations around truths because they're not truths, they're lies, but they called them truths. Well, keep in mind, these are flat-out lies, and if you believe one of them, you need to be doing a real revision of your history. I'm just telling you that now. You really need to actually look at the historical evidence we have. The truths that Early and others proposed as part of this lost cause narrative was the first one. The South was fighting for states' rights and was being enroached upon by the U.S. government. The South was no, in no way fighting for slavery. Yeah, I believe that too. Northern violations of the Constitution and National Compact of the Union between the states meant that secession was constitutional and was justifiable to protect the rights of Southerners. Mm -hmm. Many Southern generals were chivalrous heroes, especially Robert E. Lee and Thomas or Stonewall Jackson. Slavery was not immoral. It was actually better for African Americans. Slaves were happy and content with their masters, and some even fought for the Confederacy. <laughs> Ooh, I, I love the lies they tell themselves. Most of the North, including Abraham Lincoln, were racist themselves. Now, out of the, out of these supposed truths, that is the only one that I might give just a little bit credit to, because contrary to popular belief, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. By any means, he was not exactly the great uh, supporter of black African-American rights that we commonly picture of him today. He was in no way that kind of person. He more, more or less kind of freed the slaves simply because he saw it as essential to helping to save the Union. He didn't do it because he personally wanted to do it. 
but because he deemed it was a necessary action. So Lincoln, although I'm not saying he was a racist, he wasn't exactly the big abolitionist that he's been come to be portrayed as. So if any of these have a little bit of truth, that's probably the only one I would give. Sherman, General Sherman's march through Georgia in 1864 had been a crime against civilians by his destruction of their property. And Ulysses S. Grant was a drunk alcoholic and was a butcher to his soldiers. And finally, the Confederacy only lost the war due to James Longstreet's delayed arrival at Gettysburg, and they were militarily and economically outnumbered by the North. So these are the basic truths of the lost cause narrative. Now, we're going to go through these, and let's, let's just see what holes we can punch here a little bit. For the first one, the South was fighting for states' rights being enroached upon by the U.S. government. It was not in any way fighting for slavery, which is probably one of the main floorboards that's come to be accepted by modern mainstream society. In fact, it's so frightening how successful it's been that in most polls that have been conducted to see what people think was the cause of the Civil War, over 50% of these responses say it was states' rights. Less than 30% have said it was actually about slavery, which it was. That's how successful this propaganda campaign has been. People have no longer known what the true cause was. They've been told that, oh, no, it was about states' rights. It wasn't about slavery. Well, this narrative got passed down from one generation to another until eventually people forgot what the true answer was, and they never learned it. So they automatically assume it's something else because that was what was told to them. It was not fighting for slavery. In fact, we're going to say that one for last because I got some evidence here. The South was indeed fighting for slavery. In states' rights, I'm going to repeat the question. Ask this legitimately if anyone that is a pro-Southern nation, uh, Confederate, neo-Confederate, whatever you want to call them, and they might tell you, oh, it, no, it was about states' rights. Okay, I ask you this question. And if you really have an answer, give me, give me it. In, in pure terms, if you can give me an actual, plain, clear-as-day answer that actually makes sense. You say it was about states' rights. A state's right to what? I'm waiting. A state's right to what? What, uh, what right are we talking about here? You say it's about states' rights. Okay, what states' rights? I'm not saying states don't have rights. They do. But what state's right are you talking about here? Or what ones? And most often than not, they will not answer you completely. Because they know at some point, they're probably going to either have to explicitly list slavery, or at least kind of try to word it differently that it sounds not like they're using the word, but you can still tell that's what they're talking about or referring to. Ask them that next time. Oh, it's about states' rights. Okay, what states' rights? Hmm? Answer that question. A state's right to what? Hold slaves? Defy the federal government when it would say it would abolish them? And may I also point this in the states' rights uh, hole here, where they said it was about states' rights. Well, the South was all for states' rights as long as it was for their rights. In fact, during the 1850s, when anti-slavery laws got passed in the North that kind of aided in the uh, escape of runaway slaves, the South openly protested to the federal government, saying that those laws were unconstitutional by the northern states and that the federal government needed to strike them down. So it wasn't for states' rights when it went against slavery, but yet when a, states, when a law would come through or something like that that would affect the South— that would harm slavery, oh yeah, they were for it because it was hurting them. But they didn't care if it was passed in, in the northern states. States' rights didn't apply if it was against slavery. If the, if the state's law was going to protect slavery, then it was fine. If it was going to go against it, oh no, 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 that's not states' rights. So they were for as long as it was, in their terms, the correct states' rights version. Hmm. 
Northern violations of, constitu of the Constitution and the National Union Compact meant that secession was constitutional and justifiable to protect Southern rights. Well, first thing, I can strike down the Constitution one automatically. There is nowhere in the Constitution that gives secession as, as a legality. Nowhere in the Constitution does it mention that secession is legal or in any way an option. So you can't claim something's constitutional when it's not even in the Constitution. So, yeah, don't even make that argument. And just and was justifiable to protect Southern rights. Again, I asked the question, what rights? What rights are you talking about? Many Southern generals were chivalrous heroes, especially Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. May I remind you, not chivalrous means that you're perfect to goodness, honest gentlemen. Uh, yes, gentlemen civilians, like you're bowing and then handshakes and just like the basic thing of southern chivalry this sort of respect and i can tell you right now although lee may have been somewhat similar to that he was not perfect and definitely not jackson either and we'll go through that because they supported slavery they were not these perfect honest to goodness individuals they were not they were traitors one way or another if you want to put it that way Slavery was not immoral and was actually better off for African Americans. What in your whip sense of convoluted mind would say that, whip it, that putting people in a place where they're whipped, torn to bondage, have their families basically split apart, can be beat to death without crime, without being punished? How can you tell me in any respect that that was actually better off for them? Putting them to work all day and working them to death, beating them to death. How was that in any way better? Slaves were happy and content with their masters, and some even fought for the Confederacy. I can... Ch okay. Happy and content? Then why were so many slaves running away? Answer me that one. If they were honestly happy and content with the institution of slavery, why were so many slaves running away both during and way before the Civil War? Why were they running away to countries that didn't have slavery so they wouldn't be able to get captured again? Why did they do that? Because it obviously they weren't that darn, they were not that dang happy, were they? They were not content. And one of the biggest ones is that, oh yeah, there were blacks fighting for the Confederacy, so they had to support it. Wrongo. There was not blacks officially that fought for the Confederacy. If there was any, it was likely and I say this in very loose terms because the Confederacy, it was racist. They, even a master could not, a master slave owner or slaveholder could not even send a slave to fight in his stead because of how racist the Confederate government was and the people. They wouldn't even accept a slave with a gun because they feared that slave would turn on them. They did not want to entrust slave or slaves with rifles or anything like that. They were afraid the slaves would turn against them and if they armed them. So, A, none fought for the Confederacy. Now, where this probably comes from is toward the very end of the war, and by end of the war, I mean literally the last two months, within the last weeks. In February of 1865, keep, you, keep in mind the Confederacy was basically dissolved by mid-April. The Confederate Congress officially p voted to allow the conscription of African Americans into the Confederate Army. It did not guarantee their freedom. They would still be slaves, but they would officially conscript black Confederate soldiers. Unfortunately for the Confederacy, this was adopted a little too late for them to actually put into effect, and no black soldiers ever actually ended up being conscripted and put into the Confederate uniforms because of that. It was passed a little too late at the very end. And there was multiple attempts prior to February of 1865 to get African Americans into the Confederate ranks to act as a manpower source as more and more of the white Southern men were going off to fight in the war and they were getting killed. Well, the South's getting drained on manpower. Women are not going to go fight. So they got about three and a half million slaves that are servants and workers and property. Can't we send them to fight? No, because the society was that racist and that fearful of literally arming a slave. They knew, and which also goes back that slaves were happy. If they were refusing to give slaves arms, refusing to have them fight in the war because they feared them getting arms and rising up against their masters, well, why would you fear this unless you knew that your slaves were not happy with their condition? Why would an honest-to-goodness, happy-and-content slave 
be given an, be giving an armed weapon and rise up against his master unless he wasn't happy and content. Explain that to me. How could, why would you fear them rising up against you when they're supposedly so happy and content with their institution? They're obviously not that happy and content with their institution, and you know it. Because you won't give them arms. Most of the North, including Abraham Lincoln, were racist themselves. We kind of explained that one already. Now, Sherman's march through Georgia in 1864 has been a crime against civilians by his destruction of property. As you all know, probably, if you go down to Georgia today, it is commonly a hot topic if you bring up the name of General William Tecumseh Sherman, who, ironically, was from my home state of Ohio. But anyway, Sherman, if you did not know, literally in late 1864, by Christmas, he took a path with his army, marched after he took Atlanta, Georgia. He marched all the way to Savannah, Georgia, on the Atlantic coast, and on the way there, he destroyed homes and farms, burnt, destroyed the railroad lines. He basically made his men burn the crop fields. It, they just destroyed the land as they went through. And this irated, this of course enraged a lot of Southerners. They believed that, oh, he destroyed our property. That was civilian. Uh, he didn't have no right to do that. Well, Sherman was probably one of the very first modern generals because he developed a concept that is commonly known today. Sherman was a very early practitioner of the concept of total war. As Sherman himself put it, war is hell. That is how he put it. War is hell, and that is what these traitors have decided to do. I'm going to give them hell. In Sherman's mind, the Southerners were traitors because they had seceded from the Union. And very much, I'm not going to say he did, he, he did not, he had authority to do this. I mean, it, it was really a new concept. It was just unseen at the time. But the Southerners had betrayed the Union. They were fighting until the last. And Sherman basically said, you chose war. You started this. So now I'm going to, by God, I'm going to end it. And I'm going to do whatever I have to, to end it. And Sherman basically told them, you wanted to start a war, I'll show you what war looks like. He made Georgia howl, as they say it now. And honestly, to this day, he's still very controversial in the South, especially in Georgia. You don't talk about Sherman lightly. But in my opinion, Sherman had every bit of reason to go do what he did, really. Because the Southerners kind of had it coming. <laughs> and he was just the practitioner of a new policy that he was a kind of a pioneer of. But nowadays, we look at Total War like, oh yeah, we, we've done that many times and we'll do it again. It's a common military tactic. The scorched earth policy of burning out the enemy's crop fields and resources. That way they can't use them. And then cutting like their the railroads. That was cutting the transportation lines for the South. It was demoralizing the southern people. It was robbing them of food. It was robbing them of the transportation. It was basically bringing down the morale of the southern army. That way they would get closer to the point that they would just give up and surrender. War was not a game, as Sherman put it. It is hell. And that's what these people have chosen, is hell. Ulysses Grant was a drunk alcoholic and a butcher of his soldiers. This is a common misconception of Grant that has very much become the dominant uh, statement about him today. Most people, when you say Ulysses S. Grant, they recognize him. I mean, they might recognize him as the guy on the $50 bill and the guy that was the main Union general that beat Lee. But then they might add the statement, well, he was also constantly a drunkard and he was also uh, kind of a butcher to his soldiers, being the factor that he would unnecessarily launch battles and sacrifice thousands of men just to win a victory. Well, there's not really any evidence for the drunkard part because Grant, there's not really any evidence that Grant ever actually drank all that much, as much as he's purported to be. Now, he was a cigar smoker, but he, we don't really possess the evidence to actually indicate that he was a drinker. So this is something that kind of got formulated to kind of demoralize and say that, oh, Grant was a fool. He was just this drunkard old fool who really didn't know what he was doing. He just by chance beat Lee. No. Now, the butcher, that's the only thing I might give some credit to. 
Grant was very much a hard press on military general. He would keep pressing his soldiers on to get a task complete and a mission done, even if it meant that there was going to be quite a few deaths. He wasn't exactly about to back away from a fight where he knew he was going to lose a lot of men. And for this part, he may somewhat deserve a little bit of a title of over-risky, but for Butcher, Grant did not deliberately just do this to purposely kill men. He, he was not a Butcher. He wasn't someone that deliberately, with whole, wholeheartedness, just wanted to send him in there and didn't care how many he lost. Of course he cared for his men. He didn't care. He didn't care for his men. No, no he did. But he accepted that in any battle, there's going to be casualties. There will be some that don't make it back. And that's just the cost of victory at times. But Grant was not heartless and just acted like they were cows going to the slaughter and just went, oh, go, go get killed. He cared. He wasn't this heartless butcher that you Southerners seem to think he was. Which is kind of a shame because he's the guy that gave Lee the very generous terms of surrender at Apotomatux, the one where he just let them take their arms home and their horses, just go back to your farms. He was the one that helped discuss those terms. He was the one that came up with those terms. Why would you deride him? Because he was actually courteous to you. Even Lee himself praised Grant's chivalry when they met at Apotomatux. Even Lee himself praised Grant's decision. And the Confederacy only lost to Longstreet's delay of arrival at Gettysburg. The fact of the matter is, there was more than one factor as to why the Confederacy lost at Gettysburg, and Longstreet's delayed arrival was not the sole reason. So, even if he had arrived at Gettysburg on time, there's very little evidence that that would have been enough to turn the tide, because there was a lot of factors going against the Confederate Army by day three of the battle. There was a lot of factors. A. Lee's army was very much smaller than George Meade's at that time, and it was already becoming stretched. Plus, Pickett's charge was nothing but a smashing setback, as almost the entire Confederate charge line got basically annihilated. Of course, that cost Lee quite a few men that, with his smaller force, he wasn't actually just all that ready to be able to afford. <laughs> Compared to Meade, who had quite a few bit more men and could actually afford something like that. Now, there was a whole lot of... E factors, you can look them up, but I'm telling you right now, Longstreet was not the only reason why. And then, the military and economic outnumbered North, that wasn't the only thing, although this was true. The North also outweighed the South in terms of moral conviction, its morale was higher, it wasn't as plainly divided all the time as the South was, there was as there was still some pro-Union Southerners, and on top of that, the South was regarded by other countries as not exactly noble because of the slavery cause. One of the biggest blunders and setbacks for the South was its um, goal of attaining foreign recognition, which it never really got because many nations that the South basically wanted Britain and France in particular to recognize the Confederacy and come to their aid. Well, neither ever did it because both of them view, had already abolished slavery when their own, within their own societies, and they saw no reason to be supporting a nation that support that still had a system of slavery that they themselves knew to be evil and wrong, and they had already themselves abolished, so why would we appear like we want to support that? And the Southerners had purely counted on that Britain and France would come in on the Confederate side because they were the largest buyers of Southern cotton, that we can just threaten to block our cotton shipments to them, and they'll come to our side. They'll come running. King Cotton died out then, because when that happened, the Britain and France like, okay, so you're going to block our cotton? Yeah, we can get it elsewhere. Bye. So they never got the recognition that they needed in order to kind of get foreign support, which they desperately needed. The South was not in the position for a long-term war, and that was part of the reason why it lost. It's econ it had very little industry compared to the largely industrial North. Keep in mind, the South was a farming agricultural society. It was not all that industrial. They didn't have these massive factories, all that many, arms producing and munitions. They didn't have all that. They didn't have very much. Well, the North has plenty. It's been industrializing for decades. So that is not right either. So as we go here, and we will get back to the slavery part. The lost cause emerged back into the public mind. Really, it came back with full force during the early 1900s, especially during the 
1910s and 1920s as the last Confederate veterans started to die off, as the last veterans of the Confederate side were kind of getting near the end of their lives and going away. The Daughters of the Confederacy and other women's group, women's society, historical society groups were very much instrumental in erecting many of the thousands of monuments and memorials during, the, during those two decades in the country. Usually, these monuments and memorials would have an inscription or something on them that kind of promoted some form of the lost cause beliefs. And the, there's, I went and seen one this past summer. It's actually right here in Ohio at Johnson's Island. It's in uh, Sandusky Bay on Lake Erie. And it's very close to Cedar Point, the amusement park. And during the war, Johnson's Island was the site of a Confederate prisoner of war camp. Well, not a Union prisoner of war camp that held Confederate soldiers to word that differently. So this was a Union prisoner of war camp that held Confederate soldiers. And they have a graveyard up there. The, for, the camp's gone gone. It's mostly residential housing. But they have a graveyard up there that is... It's a Confederate cemetery. There are Confederate soldiers with their headstones, what state and infantry or regiment they were part of. They're all up there buried in the cemetery. And then, of course, right down on the other side of it, they got a massive statue of a Southern soldier that was dedicated in 1910 by the Daughters of the Confederacy. And it basically says Southern but it also kind of, if you read the inscription real close, it calls them Southern heroes. They were not heroes. They were fighting for a racist society and a racist institution. Many Northerners, however, during the time the Confederacy, the Lost Cause ideology was kind of taking form, they were very just kind of silent on the issue, which kind of shocks you because you're like, well, they fought a civil war over it. Wouldn't they want to just kind of stop this before the cancer really took root? The Northerners were sick of the war. They were sick of the stubbornness of the South to really just admit that it had been wrong. They were sick of the stubbornness of the South to really give African Americans their full rights. And they basically said, you know what, if they want to revise their history, do it, because I'm not in the mood for another war. The North was just sick of it. They were bored. They were tired of it. And they're like, you know what, the South's going to do this. Just let them do whatever the blank they're going to do. Because no matter what we say, they're going to ultimately do it anyway. And this was sort of what allowed for the South to revise the history of the Civil War, not just in the South, but eventually across the country. For example, in 1910, by 1910, a federal law was passed that no longer allowed for schools in their history classes to be talking about the Confederacy in a negative light in the classroom, which, of course, is a wrong because why would you not talk about it in a negative light? It stood for something immoral and evil. And today, unfortunately, that lost cause has become a major proponent ideology of many hate groups, of many ter domestic terrorist groups, such as the KKK and many others. There's many others. Many of these modern groups. And then, of course, racist attacks, such as the one on the Charleston, uh, South Carolina church in, I think, 2015, the, Char the Charlottesville riots, I think, in 20, what was it, 17, I think. All those, and of course last year as well, these have become rooted in these people's ideologies as justifiable. That the South was not wrong, that it was never fighting for slavery, so thus the Confederate flag and all the statues, they're fine. They mean no harm. Yeah, they do. So before we go end here, I want, as I mentioned, we we're going to talk about here with the slavery. I didn't really hit that one. Where we said, the main argument is that it was about never about slavery. You need to go back in time because I can read you here from quotes from historical from two historical documents. I mean, there's much more than this. I just picked five good examples. We got two quotes from two historical documents, and we got three historical political leaders of the Confederacy that basically tell you straight out it was about slavery. Your own ancestors knew that. So, for example, here, you argue it wasn't about slavery. Answer me why these quotes I found on the internet and looked up these documents, looked up these people, and you can go there and look up yourself too. Tell me why these exist. In the Ordinance of Secession passed by South Carolina in December of 1860, there was a quote in one of the paragraphs that literally stated this. 
our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. So South Carolina straight out said, oh yeah, it was slavery, but yet you're going to sit there and tell me it wasn't? Okay. Well, that was South Carolina. Okay. Here's Louisiana, January of 1861. The people of the slaveholding states are bound together by the same necessity and determination to preserve African slavery. Hmm, that's two states. And tech, I didn't write the Texas one down, but you can look it up yourself. But I remember the one in Texas, although it does not mention slavery, at least in the portion I saw of it, it does mention that equal rights and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are only guaranteed to white men. Not black men, white Confederate President Jefferson Davis stated this, African slavery as it exists in the United States is a moral, a social, and a political blessing. <laughs> Your favorite, Robert E. Lee. The blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, physically, and socially. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their future instruction as a race and will prepare them for better things. So you're telling me that it is necessary that African Americans had to be beat, had to be whipped, had to be have their families split apart and basically work like dogs. You're telling me that that was all necessary for the African Amer for the African race just so they could evolve or kind of better adapt? and evolve as a people? You're telling me that was necessary? Where in human history do you read that with the white race? Never. So why would it be any different for them? What about African, What about the African race makes it necessary for slavery? Nothing. So your favorite, Robert E. Lee, literally says, blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa? and that painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their future instruction as a race. <laughs> and here's the one that kills me. If this was from stated by Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy in 1861, shortly after the creation of the Confederate government. This was his from his cornerstone speech. And this right here basically sums up what the Confederate government was about in one nutshell. And this is coming from the Confederate vice president who helped to create the Confederacy. He was there at the conference, at the little convention in Montgomery, Alabama, that created the original seven state Confederacy. He was there. And he summed it up like this. Oh, but it's not about slavery. Keep that in mind here. It's not about slavery, but tell me if this sounds like it was about slavery, because it awfully dang sure does to me. From Alex, quoting Alexander Stevens, Vice President of the Confederacy, Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests, upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, that slavery subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. The vice president of the Confederacy, who is a leader of the Confederacy, himself stating that it, the Confederate government's foundation rested upon the basis of the belief that the African-American man, or the N-word, as one of the N-words is he wanted to use, that, an Af that the African American was in no way equal to the white man, and that slavery was his natural place in life. This is coming from your own vice president, but yet you will sit there and lie to me and tell me, oh, it wasn't about slavery. This is coming from your own vice president for crying out loud. Read that. Read it. And if you don't believe my word, go up and look this up. I found this online. You can go to almost any historical site that talks about him, and you will find this. Oh, but it was not about slavery. Bull crap. You are nothing but misguided, selfless, worshipful fools. That's all you are. You're a cult. It's sick.
and then you will sit there and pass on these lies to your generations that are yet to come, mostly your kids, and you will pass this lie on so that it continues further. What is wrong with you? I understand maybe if you never learned about it, but if you knew and you're still passing it on, you're a piece of crap. That's really what you are. You are honestly that. You are a worthless human being if you say that. Oh, slavery was not about the real cause. It was okay. Really? How about I put you in the same position in that time? We'll see how long you last. So here we have a picture of Jubal Early, who was the man responsible for the former Confederate cavalry general who was mainly one of the main early pro uh, originators of the Lost Cause narrative. And then here, you can go, if you go to Georgia, they got up at Stone Mountain a statue that kind of just, although it's not exactly for the Lost Cause, it perpetrates an idea of the Lost Cause where, like, where Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, and even Jefferson Davis to an extent are like these chivalrous, modern, big old great figures. Stone Mountain has that statue of all three on horseback. And although it's not directly for the Lost Cause, it kind of promotes the narrative of it. They, they pose these men in a chivalrous-looking, honorable position like they were just fine great men marching off into the future. Lee, Davis, Jackson. Oh, but yeah, it was fine. It was in no way fine. So anyway, that is the lost cause here. Now, I don't know who in their right mind can still believe this, but obviously we wouldn't be talking about it if we did. But it's important that you actually look at history because when we don't, that's when you get this discrepancy. That's where you get these idiots who will go tell you otherwise because they haven't read a book in their life and all they've heard is hearsay. Read the facts. Look up the research that actually can back up what you're claiming, and you'll find that if you're trying to find research that backs up the lost cause, you're going to find a lot less of that than you're going to find in the defense that slavery was, of course, the primary cause. You're going to find a lot more on that subject than you will ever trying to say that slavery was never the cause. So that's the lost cause video. for. Okay, so... Hopefully by the end of this week, and yes, I know by the end of this week, we will have another video at the end of this week. We will be do going back and doing our next video out of the uh, President series. I don't think we've actually done one quite yet for this year, because I think the last one we did was on New Year's Eve. We will hit the fifth president of the United States, where we left off on the fourth back in December, and that was James Madison. So we are going on to the fifth president there, and that will be James Monroe. Definitely one of our better presidents especially lesser known since he served during a peaceful time era. So we will hit that video next. So that will be at the end of this week. So as always, like, subscribe, thumbs up, comments, questions, as always, suggestions, any of that stuff. Just put that down below or do the other things with the buttons that you got to actually push. But anyway, that ends it for today. So I hope everyone has a good rest of their day. And honestly, if you see any of this misinformation about the lost cause out there, refute it. Try to teach the newer generations about the truth that has actually occurred. Don't teach them this lie out racist ideology. Don't teach them that. The only reason this exists in reality, really, is because unlike other civil wars where the losers were actually exiled or executed or something like that or jailed after the civil war, people that lost it were simply sent home they weren't they didn't leave the country they were still here and thus they were able, able to be here and propagate whatever their mindset for ideology had been and they were still here to kind of convey what their beliefs had been so anyway that ends it for today so have a good day and we will hopefully see you all back here later in the week and may god bless you all